Well, along with the life and times of Leopold Cohn, and uh, Yaakov did such a wonderful job of introducing uh, the importance of the next person in line, which was Joseph Hoffman Cohn. And so it uh, fell upon me, uh, happily so, assigned to me by Men Menachem. It fell upon me to talk about uh, Joseph Hoffman Cohn. Uh, now, in my office in Manhattan, I have a beautiful picture of Leopold Cohn with a very kind smile. Uh, he was exotic, in my opinion. And so whenever I'm there trying to solve a, a problem, usually, you know, something to do with, with staff working in Brooklyn, but when I'm <laughs> trying to solve a problem, sort of, I, I can almost hear Leopold saying, would you pray about that? Just pray about it. And then I look at the next picture over, which is a, sort of a version of this one of Joseph, and I hear the other voice that says, don't let him spend that. <laughs> and so uh, uh, they have both been inspirations for me to be uh, schizophrenic. And, <laughs> but they are two sides of the same coin because you need both. And you need prayer and you need management. And I agree with, in general, with Yaakov that the beautiful foundation that Leopold Cohn laid for Chosen People Ministries was the foundation of someone who was incredibly transformed by the power of God. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about all this, about Leopold Cohn, about uh, whether he was a horse thief or a swindler or a bank robber or, you know, or all these other things, and then came to the New World. And, uh, well, you know, uh, some of us were not, you know, we were just not the best people before we became believers in Jesus, you know. And so I remember the day I realized I sold drugs to minors. Now, I was a minor, but still, <laughs> I did. <laughs> and, and so I've never cared about this issue, you know. And, uh, but the best, the best part was questioning his, uh, his, his Jewish yichus, his uh, heritage, whether or not he was actually trained at a yeshiva, which I'm happy to find out that he was trained at the yeshiva where we thought he was trained. Don't forget that. And, and so I remember once I wrote something in the Chosen People newsletter, and I mentioned where I had my bar mitzvah, which was at the Young Israel of Kew Garden Hills in Queens, which was a modern Orthodox synagogue. And Rabbi Schoenfeld, who is a, a leader in the Orthodox, modern Orthodox movement, was my rabbi who did my bar mitzvah. And people like me went to Hebrew school four days a week, not one day a week, or two days a week, but for a long time. And anyway, so uh, one day I get a letter from uh, Yossi Schoenfeld, who is Fabian Schoenfeld's son, who said, I read your newsletter. That was news to me. And he, he said, there is no way my father ever bar mitzvahed you. Well, then a movie comes out as we were starting uh, the center here, and Malcolm Honline, who I have great respect for, who's a significant Jewish leader, he's the president of the Organization of American Jewish Institution Presidents. He's the president of the presidents, you know? And uh, he gets in this video put out by the Brooklyn Experience, and he announces, and we know that the leader of this organization, he didn't want to name me by name, the leader of this organization is actually not really Jewish. And I looked at that and I said, boy, news to me. <laughs> but the best part was when I went to my mother and I showed her Yossi Schoenfeld, my mother who was not a believer at that time for sure, I, I showed her Yossi Schoenfeld's letter and I said, hey mom, you may not know this, but I really am not Jewish, and I was not bar mitzvahed in Queens. So could you, I, I, I thought I remembered that, and I do have the picture, the album. So I mean, I don't, I saw myself in a tux. I must have been bar mitzvahed. And so, and I still have the fountain pen. So when, you know, what, what, what's the story here? And she, 
she looked at this letter and she shook her head and said, you know, his father was okay, but this kid was always uh, not going to repeat it. <laughs> Use your imagination. My mother was very earthy. And I said, do you have any canceled checks maybe that I can send to him? And she just said, mm, you know. So whatever it was, I'm sure that Leopold Kahn was who Leopold Kahn thought he was. And uh, did Leopold Kahn have opposition? Oh my gosh, do I have opposition? Do you have opposition? Of course we do. Do people deny what we think is true simply because we lived it? Yes, yes, uh, that's true. And the enemies come uh, from all over the place. And uh, so um, I do think that uh, Leopold was who Leopold said he was. And, uh, and even if it turns out that he was a horse thief, which is one of the accusations. Well, who knows? Maybe when he became a believer, he went back to Hungary and offered to give the guy back his horse. You know, But to, to argue for the sainthood of those of us who are Jewish who came to faith in Yeshua, is a, it's, it's really not a good way to go. And so if you are guilty of romanticizing Leopold Kohn and making him into an otherworldly saint, which he was not, then you probably should reconsider. And so I'm thankful for the excellent historical facts, uh, which we will consider. Uh, when you leave this afternoon, we're, uh, we're going to give you a copy of Brian Crawford's uh, little 30-page paper, uh, where he went through all of the trials and everything, and, and we'll point out some other evidence that Leopold Kohn uh, was who he said he was, and so on. And, uh, and I would say, again, he was who he said he was, but he was a sinner just like me. And he was probably guilty of all sorts of things. <laughs> just ask, ask Rose when you see her. So, All right. So my task is to talk about the builder of Chosen People Ministries, Joseph Hoffman Cohen. I'm going to read some and chat some, so try and stay awake, pay attention. And if I see you going to sleep, I'm going to go like that and change the PowerPoint so you'll pay attention. So Joseph Hoffman Cohn served as the second general secretary, which was the term uh, that most missions used at that time, of Chosen People Ministries. And I, of course, have the joy of serving as the seventh leader of Chosen People Ministries. So seven leaders in 125 years. And uh, a lot of it was, was the Cones from uh, 1894 until Joseph died in 1953. Joseph was a prolific writer and communicator. His writing, sermons, and radio broadcasts span multiple decades. So it's almost impossible to catalog and communicate his thinking about God, the Messiah, the Jewish people, the work of the mission, um, due to the sheer volume of his contributions. He was incredibly prolific. And uh, just so you know, we've been doing, one of our 125th year projects was to, and we've been doing this for about four or five years, was to digitize everything that chosen people had. And we have not made it yet, but we've gone pretty far. And it's not perfect, but it's, it is researchable. So we have all of our newsletters going back to 1895 uh, digitized and uh, available. Only you need to have permission and the URL or else you can't use it. And we've also done a lot of our board minutes. We've done a lot of our movies, our 8 millimeter, 16 millimeter, and so on, and uh, a lot of our other stuff. And, uh, and, so, and you'll hear some of that uh, today as we go on. So I'll just give a brief summary of his life and accomplishments, and then turn our attention to what I really want to talk about, which is the variety of shaping experiences that impacted his life and strategies and methods and values, which he communicated to the organization, which in one shape or another exists until this day. As it is with many great leaders, and I think he was a great leader, their true legacy is not in the organization, or buildings which are built, which he did, 
the programs or funding which were created, which he did, or institutions, but rather it's the values and the ways in which they shape the future of the organization they led. So in my opinion, that's the, the legacy of Joseph Hoffman Cohn that I'd like to speak with you about. Um, sources of information, again, chosen people, new, ministries, newsletters, board minutes, some writings of Joseph Hoffman Cohn, his published books, all held in the Chosen People Ministries ar archives, <laughs> along with what we've now discovered are over 400 radio programs, which were, com uh, which were preserved on wax cones that we have digitized. So it's pretty cool. Um, I'm a bit of a missions historian, so I know that while creating history, we have to record history, or else, can I use a Yiddish word, the poor Schmendrick who's trying to put together the history in 40, 50 years doesn't know what to do. So we're going to try and help that person, who might be one of you, or maybe they're not born yet, but we want to we want to provide some help for them. So just a little biographical uh, sketch. Uh, so Joseph was born on March 27th, 1886, died on October 5th, 1953. He was the second eldest son of the founder of Chosen People Ministries, Rabbi Leopold Cohn, whom you have met. Okay. And his wife, Rose. Okay, good. And... Uh, we have a little bit about his family tree, just a little bit. So um, you have Leopold and Rose, then you have uh, Benjamin, Joseph, who we're talking about, who married Josephine, Joshua Cohn, we're in touch with his granddaughter, uh, who lives in northern Arkansas, uh, and then Esther Cohn, and then the youngest son, uh, David Cohen, uh, who passed away at a fairly young age in his early 30s. A few, few weeks ago, we took the chosen people aboard, and we visited Leopold's uh, grave uh, at the Cypress Hill Semi uh, Seminary, Cemetery. I get the two confused all the time. <laughs> That was unintentional. I genuinely get them confused. But, and so, uh, Cypress Hills. Cypress Hills. Cypress Hills is not in Long Island. That's where my family's all buried, uh, in Montefiore. No, Cypress Hills is actually off the Interboro Parkway, the Jackie Robinson Parkway. It's, it's the netherworld between Brooklyn and Queens, OK? And, uh, and so uh, Zahav and I had visited once before. We thought we knew where the grave was. We got there, and uh, you know it was very hard to find the grave. But eventually, uh, we did. And you've got Joseph, you've got Leopold, and, and uh, Rose all in that one grave site. And then you had David uh, was buried there uh, as well. Yes, it was, it was, Cypress Hills is not a Jewish cemetery, but it does have many Jewish people buried there. So that was, David's referring to the fact that Chosen People still owns about 14 burial sites uh, in the New York area because it's always a hardship for Jewish believers to know where the, to get buried because, and Ben Volman can tell you the story of, of uh, Les Jacobs' father in Toronto who is going to be buried in a Jewish cemetery and what happened there. So there's, there's a lot of, there are a lot of woes, but at least that's the one woe of being a Messianic Jew that you really won't care about. <laughs> so Joseph uh, led uh, the American Board of Missions to the Jews, ABMJ. Now it's very different. We have Williamsburg Mission to the Jews. That was incorporated in 1923. Then we have the American Board of Missions to the Jews, and then you have the Chosen People Ministries. The Williamsburg Mission to the Jews still exists. So we did not change the name, we kept the entity. And then 
the American Board of Missions to the Jews, in 1982, the name was changed. And so some people have actually asked me, um, after I preached somewhere, they said, you know, we really uh, love your ministry. It seems great. By the way, do you ever know what, what happened to that really wonderful mission, the American Board of Missions to the Jews? <laughs> and, but we changed the name. Uh, but the one thing that stayed in common was the name of the magazine, which from 1895 until today is called Chosen People. So that's been the constant. So he led the American Board, or ABMJ, from the time of his father's passing in 1937 until his own death, and both father and son died on the job. Uh, the memorial service itself took place at the 236 West 72nd uh, Street uh, Center on Thursday night, October 8th, 1953. And just also by way of background, uh, he married Josephine Stone in 1917, who was originally from Detroit, was a Barnard graduate. Now, those of you who are not New Yorkers just don't get it when I say that. Okay, when we say Barnard graduate, that's like a Harvard Law School graduate. Okay, so that's where Jewish immigrants' children's went, children went to step up. Okay, it was it, at one time it, be, it was a pretty blue, New York blue buds blue blood school, but eventually, of course, it became a very Jewish school. Josephine and Joseph had three kids: Cordelia, Joseph Jr., and Huntley who was named after the benefactress to the mission, Frances J. Huntley. Josephine passed away at the age of 75 in Detroit in 1960, and her father was both a school superintendent and uh, was a su very successful businessman. I have good reason to believe that he was quite wealthy. And uh, I found Josephine's uh, uh, obit, and then I also found her, her father's obit. And so in reading his obituary, it says, Detroit industrialist passes, you know, dies. So obviously he was a little more than a school superintendent and sent his daughter to Barnard. Joseph attended Adelphi College in Brooklyn at that time and studied at Moody Bible Institute, though he did not graduate Moody Bible Institute. He only went about a year. And was granted a Doctor of Divinity, an honorary doctorate like his father had from Wheaton, but Joseph got it from Los Angeles Baptist College in 1937, the same year as his father died. And the same year, he officially became the general secretary of the ABMJ. And with all of the back and forth with, uh, with, with the Baptists, which I'll get into a little bit, he was a member of the Long Island Baptist Ministers Association at the time of his death. So something worked out uh, at that time. Uh, Joseph uh, had been writing a book about the history of chosen people entitled, entitled, I Fought the Good Fight, we'll look at that in a moment, which he completed on October 1st, 1953, just a few days before he suddenly died of a heart attack. Four days after completing this book, he passed away and was buried alongside his mother and father. As one of the board members of the ABMJ said, on Thursday, October 1, Joseph finished correcting the proofs of his book, and in his bold hand, he joyfully wrote Fini on his copy. Indeed, he had fought a good fight, but he had also finished his course. The name of the book was I Fought the Good Fight. Joseph was actually born in Hungary and immigrated to the US with his mom and, four, and three other siblings by way of Edinburgh, where Rose and the kids went to either say goodbye or reconnect with Le Leopold in Edinburgh because there was a lot of stress at home. And uh, according to uh, Joseph's reflections, it was not actually a, an immigration, it was an escape. Because Rose's family uh, was uh, virtually keeping her in captivity because they had heard about Leopold's newfound religion and wanted to keep, they wanted to, to destroy the marriage. Maybe they had other reasons for destroying the marriage too. I don't know. But Joseph writes 
almost as an aside, and I fought the good fight. There were four of us who sailed across the waters from Europe when my mother had managed to escape from her alert relatives who were watching her day and night. It was one black midnight that I can still remember as a boy of seven, so he was seven years old, that a lumber box wagon drove up to our house. The wagon was drawn by one uh, rather bulky horse. I just love his writing. And the driver was my father's nephew from a town called Seget. Menachem Moti, am I right? Seget. Right, Seget. Uh, 12 miles away, and they, they all got into the lumber box body, you know, all four of them, and they spread a canvas over them in order to get away. And all night we rumbled and rumbled along, and early in the morning, the bedraggled horse, don't they, I mean, the guy was just a great rider. The bedraggled horse came to a stop in front of the little house in which lived my father's nephew and his family. And from there came the flight by train in Berlin, and then to Hamburg, and then Edinburgh. There's always a lot to learn about the life of a man from his obituary. Do I hope all of you, you, you start reading obituaries probably when you pass 60. Okay, and uh, how many of you love the New York Times obituaries? And how old are you? Good, okay. <laughs> Greg, you really need to read them, you know. But in my historical, in my historical research, uh, particularly studying Jewish believers in the 19th century, I found that the obituaries were great. In fact, the International Hebrew Christian Alliance magazines, which are all on microfilm, probably digitized, but they, they reported on the death of, of the members, and Ben will agree, right, it, and David. It was the best place to find out the true story on a lot of these people. Uh, a particular interest to me is the special Joseph Hoffman Cohn Memorial Edition of the Chosen People newsletter. And uh, so the whole newsletter was memorializing uh, Joseph and had wonderful testimonies. Uh, it highlighted his character and achievements, speaks about Joseph's spirituality, his love for Yeshua the Messiah. He's described as a man of convic conviction. Uh, his beliefs were strong in doctrine and theology and influenced the ways in which he led and shaped chosen people uh, ministries. Uh, the editor of the memorial newsletter said this, to him, the great teachings of the Bible, the atoning work of Christ, the place of his will in God's, of Israel in God's program, the pre-tribulational rapture of the church, very important, and the premillennial return of our Lord Jesus, for more than just the, were, ju were more than just theological term terminology. They were the foundation upon which his life's work was built. Like his beloved father, Leopold and Joseph had the unshakable conviction that the Bible doctrine of to the Jew first was just as imperative today as it was the day it was first uttered by the Apostle Paul. Uh, the author describes Joseph as a contender for the faith. This speaks directly to the fundamentalist liberal controversies of those days, which were very significant and were mentioned uh, by, uh, was it by Menachem, I think, uh, mentioned it. Someone mentioned it uh, uh, the other night. And that was a very important uh, struggle. And Cohn sided, of course, with the fundamentalists. And his alignment with the fundamentalists, whether they be Baptist, Presbyterian, whatever they were, was very, very important for Joseph and Chosen People Ministries. And Yaakov spelled it out as well, that uh, Joseph and Leopold understood how to align themselves, though uneasy about the alignment, with the more conservative Protestant movements in the United States at that time. Uh, the author of the, this volume says, they struggle between fundamentalism and liberalism, the struggle between fundamentalism and liberalism, liberalism found him always on the battle line, warring for the faith delivered to the saints. Time and eternity alone will count the worth of this ministry as a Bible teacher of the written and spoken word. He kept the faith, and because he did, uh, so many who wavered um, were established. Those who were fighting the battle were strengthened and encouraged by his presence at their side. 
Um, it was Biola University that helped sponsor a series of volumes called The Fundamentals, which were written in the mid-30s. And The Fundamentals dealt with the virgin birth, and it dealt with, uh, it was mixed, mixed together with uh, premillennialism and uh, the role of Israel, although it was edited by a Jewish believer, Louis Meyer, who was a Presbyterian minister. And uh, the, the ABMJ and Joseph Hoffman Cohen, they were in deep with Biola, and they were in deep, even at that time, the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, which is what our seminary here, the Feinberg Center, is part of. But they were in deep with this and very concerned about the fundamentals. Some of the great leaders at Biola were involved with it as well. It was a real battle. So Cohn was a prolific writer as seen through his articles in the Chosen People magazine, newsletters, books, and tracts, his writing of the Shepherd of Israel. Alan will talk a little bit more about it. And also as a Bible teacher and radio preacher through the Chosen People Radio Hour. Uh, and of course, he wrote the monthly newsletter and probably started editing that newsletter 20 years before he became the editor when his, his father passed away. He was also a remarkably good businessman and built the financial base of the organization, purchased multiple properties, and generally placed the mission on a very good financial uh, footing. I thought that I would uh, introduce you right now to his voice. So have a listen to a few moments of the Chosen People radio broadcast. Bring to you Dr. Joseph Hoffman Cohen, editor of the missionary and Bible teaching magazine, The Chosen People. We seek to give to God's children an insight into the Bible teaching concerning world events. And now, here's Dr. Cohen. You'll remember we finished last week the 46th Psalm. And again, let me just review for you a little bit. Uh, this is the series that we are now in called Preview to Armageddon. And we have shown, you remember, God's uh, future dealings as they are laid out for us in his book, uh, his future destinies for the godless nations of this earth his destinies in the keeping of his covenants uh, given uh, through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob on the sole ground uh, that God uh, does not break his sworn word. We may be faithless. We may depart far afield from his leading, but God never break his promises. You met him? Yeah, you can. Oh, well, sure. Um, I'm sure. Uh, so uh, what language did he grow up speaking? Could you detect a, a was he speaking Yinglish there, you think? Not really. He had, I can hear a little bit of it, that it was a second language, you know? And part of that was because he was so brilliant, he was trying to work all the accents uh, in, you know? Because that God was the way a lot of the fundamentalist radio preachers <laughs> said God. It's true. And so he was, he was, he was mimicking it. It wasn't natural to him. And the other thing is that, that he, it wasn't a speech impediment, but that's where I think the Yiddish came in. It, it seemed like he was uneasy with it. But man, if you didn't hear his New York accent, you really missed it. You know, I mean, he was definitely uh, a New Yorker. And so, <clears throat> so we have 400 of these if you'd like to listen to them. Uh, now, Let me uh, just sum up a little bit of his, um, uh, this resolution is, is uh, really wonderful. And uh, see if I can read it, just some of it. It's a little small. It's almost like everybody around the ABMJ at that time could write. 
you know. And uh, so it's a good thing we do a lot of writing. You know, it's, it's in, our, in, our, in our DNA. So a tribute to Dr. Joseph Hoffman He has God. His chair is empty. <laughs> a vacancy has taken place in the hearts of multitudes. Thousands upon thousands throughout the land and across the seas bow in sorrow in the loss of a great friend, but rejoice in the achievements of a victorious life. It's beautiful, huh? He slipped away so quietly at the peak of his activities. His book of the history of the mission just finished. The material for the chosen people for November and December just finished. The birthday gifts delivered to his grandchild, whose birthday was yet in the month to come, just as though the Lord had said to him, son, get ready, you're going home to the father's house. Those who were in close association with him during the past two years or more decades best realize what it meant to have great fellowship with this man of God. The days ahead are going to be hard for them. They will have to lean on him, hard on him, whose everlasting arms were always great. I'm going to skip to the other side. God gave him rare executive and administrative ability gave him great gifts of writing so that one could hardly finish one paragraph in anticipation of what the next would reveal. I'd like to know who wrote this. They, we'd hire them right away. <laughs> gave him great gifts as an expositor so that he was totally unable to meet the demands for his ministry that came to him from all over the country. Gave him great gifts in appraising men and women, enabling him to penetrate through the exterior and determine what was in the heart, that the personnel of the mission would be above reproach, gave him great reserve of faith and strength to withstand the Satan-inspired attacks that were leveled at him through the years. Never forget the attacks. And then he goes on, and gave him great powers of discernment in the study of the scriptures, enabling him to answer multitudes of those seeking light, gave him a phenomenal memory, a quick mind, Ability to reach immediate decisions with exceptional inerrancy. And so we could go on and on, reaching the bottom of the well of God's reserves. I don't know whoever wrote that, but that's Zahava, if you can give up your caretaker role and find out who that person is, if they're still alive, no matter how old they are, I'd like them to write my obituary, maybe even before I die, so that they can... I thought so, thought so. But you're getting the story, aren't you? And Yaakov, you know, Yaakov tipped, his, tipped the hand, so to speak. If Leopold was the tzaddik and the visionary, then Joseph was the entrepreneur, the builder, the financier, the administrator, the networker, the one who would cobble together a global organization that was designed to accomplish the vision and the purposes of his father. So just some achievements. At the time of Joseph's death, the ABMJ maintained a seven-story headquarters building at 236 West 72nd Street in Manhattan, and uh, uh, which is today worth over $12 million, just so you know. 11 missionary centers in the US and six overseas. There were a total of 32 ABMJ missionaries on staff in North America. Cohn had a deep personal interest in France, and I do too, as demonstrated by the five staff members serving with ABMJ at that time. The ABMJ published the Chosen People magazine monthly, and this was a real task. It was long, as well as the Shepherd of Israel on a periodical basis, which was an evangelistic publication produced in both Yiddish and English and French and I think there were versions in Farsi and versions in Hebrew and so on. And it's called, to, to this day, it is still published, but it's called Le Berger d'Israël. It's published regularly in France. The ABMJ maintained a training school for Christian workers interested in Jewish evangelism that was eventually run by Henry Height, who was the founder of Lancaster Bible College, for those of you who are Pennsylvanians. Um, 
They had a group called the World Fellowship of Christian Jews, um, which was probably uh, Cohen's rebellion against the Hebrew Christian Alliance so that they could have their own thing. Um, also, the mission published many different uh, uh, books for Christian workers interested in Jewish evangelism and for Jewish people interested in the gospel. They did a in 1941, they did a revision of the 1901 Bregman Yiddish New Testament published by the British Foreign Bible Society, and so on. Uh, the Chosen People uh, radio program was heard on 44 stations uh, around the, uh, the globe, uh, mostly in the US and Canada. And they had an advisory board of some of 11 at that time, some of the most significant Christian leaders in the United States. Um, just to show you some of uh, what he wrote. Got it? Okay. So one of his books was uh, Beginning in Jerusalem. You can tell this Romans 1 6 thing skips to Acts 1 8 there, uh, were very important to him. I had to take the cover off, it was getting torn. But this is the book. Beginning, in, beginning at Jerusalem, every January, the Cohens, from early on, wrote some kind of theme on bringing the gospel to the Jew first. And that was always the January edition of, of the newsletter and the January edition of, of what he wrote. And uh, you can read some of that up there. Uh, the next book that is really uh, important, uh, actually uh, two of them, was I Fought the Good Fight. And uh, so that's a copy of I Fought the Good Fight. And it's war story after war story after war story. Talks about chosen people donors, talks about the battles in the Brooklyn courts, talks about his father's testimony. I mean, uh, there was a controversy where someone, uh, there was a, a group that were running the ABMJ work in Buffalo led by AB. A.B., not A.B., A.B. Macklin, who's a Jewish believer, and uh, he split, took a bunch of donors and missionaries with him, and got hold of Harry Ironsides at Moody Memorial Church in Chicago, which was one of the largest church in, churches in the country at that time, and a great supporter, even in the late 40s, of Chosen People Ministries and before. And uh, eventually... Uh, there was a war between Macklin and Joseph Hoffman Cohen. And once again, now Joseph was in the court of Christian leaders, like his father was earlier. And eventually was exonerated by these Christian leaders. And Harry Ironside issued an apology for siding with A.B. Macklin, which was published in the Chosen People newsletter. So, you know, we can avoid all this contentiousness and make believe it didn't happen. But it was a very, he was very feisty, it, and it was a very feisty situation. Now, his relation, uh, the other book is uh, I Have Loved Jacob, or Jacob Have I Loved in some versions, and I'll, I'll tell you about this one in just a moment. Are you going to give me time signals? Ah, you weren't just praying. Uh, uh, also, you actually can go to the next one, Juan. He wrote a lot of tracts, and in these tracts, we can see his concerns. And so, uh, how near is Armageddon? Can Hitler win? He, he, he wrote, wrote that in 1943. And then, one of his favorite themes, has the church robbed the Jews? So, the Cohens had a very uneasy relationship with that. He learned his Jewishness at his father's knee uh, and uh, grew up in a Yiddish-speaking home. When he learned English, I'm not sure, but probably at a very young age. My mother grew up in, in a Yiddish-speaking home. She didn't learn English until first grade, is what she told me. And so I would imagine most of his very young years were in Yiddish. And also, he was constantly surrounded uh, by uh, 
Jewish immigrants. Both father and son kept kosher in terms of his Jewish identity. He had a very strong Jewish identity. He also had a strong relationship with the, the, the church, mostly the fundamentalist movement. So you could get confused and say, well, he just embraced Christian culture to totally and didn't go to a messianic congregation. Of course not. He, they started a messianic congregation in Brooklyn, in Williamsburg. They've always had messianic congregations. And so they always had meetings of Jewish people. They always celebrated the Jewish holidays. Of course, they also celebrated Christmas. But they always did. And for the longest number of years, the services were all in Yiddish. This reflects the Messianic movement as it was in Europe. Because almost all the missions to the Jews, whether it be the Anglican mission to the Jews, CMJ, or whether it be uh, the United Church of Scotland mission to the Jews, wherever they were, from Poland to Romania, to wh wherever they were, they had congregations of Jewish believers there were Messianic congregations. They kept the Jewish calendar, and, and it was either in Yiddish, and they also had some congregations in Ladino in North Africa. And so they were always doing Messianic congregations. So it made sense. But they, they did build strong, effective relationships uh, with the church. So Leopold Kohn was accused of being a Seventh-day Adventist because they said he was a vegetarian and never worked on Saturday. Uh, Joseph, in I Fought the Good Fight, goes into great detail. And uh, he, he, actually, uh, he actually says, um, pork he would never touch of his father, and it was not allowed at any time in our home, and so would the forbidden animals of the Bible and the creatures of the waters. The Mosaic law was adhered to. When it came time for Passover, we kept the feast at our home. My father had been brought up among the Hasidic Jews of Europe, which made him an ultra-fanatic in obeying the Mosaic law. I don't, I don't think it was used negatively. This training in the home remained with me at the present hour, so that I, too, have never knowingly eaten pork, ham or bacon, lobster, crab, clams, or oysters. He must have been looking at a menu, though. For all of this, for all of this he was continually attacked, even by certain Jews who had already accepted Christ. Now, he goes on to say that part of the motivation for my father also was to live as a Jew among the Jews. It was a mission, missionary principle. But it was the way they were raised. So it wasn't that hard to live as a Jew among uh, the Jews. And all of that Jewish, um, all of that Jewishness flowed into chosen people ministries in one way or another. It was a reflection of a growing, changing, new immigrant, becoming more American, Jewish identity that was so typical of the Jewish people, millions of us, in New York City, and very similar to the home I, I was raised in. But one of the innovations, and uh, Menachem has made mention of it, uh, Moti to some degree, and Yaakov also, is that one of the un unique things about Cohen's, even Joseph, maybe more so, was this integration of Jewishness and the gospel. Whereas previously, you had to make a choice. You're either a Jew or a Christian. Cohen said, we're not going to make that choice. You may not like the way we live as Jews, but we're going to live as Jews, and the way we want to live as Jews but we're living as Jews because we're Jews. And so chosen people ministry, in contradistinction to some of the Scandinavian, German, and even British Jewish missions, was always a Jewish Jewish mission. So that even the Gentiles, not that the Gentiles became Jews, but the Gentiles who were part of chosen people ministries, in one way or another, assimilated. <laughs> The Cones, though, often struggled to fit into American society and even more the fundamentalist movement. Though Joseph was naturally far more American in culture and language than his father, Joseph's concern for the Jewish people and Jewish life often brought a degree of conflict with his Christian friends and even Jewish Christian friends 
who are either or people, and supporters as neither Leopold nor Joseph ever felt at home in the church. Now, one of the close associates of Joseph Hoffman Cohn was Charles Feinberger. 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 Was Charles. <laughs> was, I'm Russian. Was Charles Feinberg. And Charles Feinberg was the first dean of the Talbot School of Theology. We named this building and this program after him. He came, Feinberg came to the Lord through the work of John Solomon, who was one of the first ABMJ missionaries who reported directly to Joseph Hoffman Cohn, although he was fielded and sent out by Leopold. And John Solomon led Charles Feinberg to Jesus in Pittsburgh when Feinberg was a rabbinical student. And so he looked at Joseph Feinberg did as sort of a father. I attended Talbot Seminary in the last year of Charles Feinberg's career. And I walked into my first class on Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and hermeneutics. And I did what I usually did. And there were 100 guys in this class, no women at the time. It's a very ugly school. And I sat there, and I leaned back in my chair, kind of more like a tiger ready. I was commuting from Santa Monica, so it was long. But, but I was kind of leaning back, sort of like ready to pounce. And in the middle of the class, in front of 100 people, Feinberg looks at me and says, Mr. Glazer, if you don't sit up straight, you can just get up and get out. I was not used to that behavior. And so I sat up. And at the end of the class, I was walking out sheepishly, hoping that he would notice me walking past him. And uh, he said, please come see me in my office. I said, oh, man, my first semester, I'm trying to be such a good Jewish boy, you know? <laughs> and so I walk into his office, and he looks at me, and he says, how's it going? I said, well, it was a rough morning. <laughs> And he said, how, how are your parents? Are they believers yet? I said, no. He says, mm, yes, mine neither. Uh, well, he hadn't talked to his parents in 30 years. They didn't want to hear from him. And so I, he says, are you in regular touch with them? I said, yes, yeah. They're not too happy with what I believe. He says, yes, we have to keep praying for them. Why don't we pray for your parents now? And he holds my hand, and he prays with I mean, he just yelled at me. Now, he's holding my hand. You know, the sweetest prayer for my, and so on. And I thought that was it. And I really got away with it. And then I'm starting to get up, and he looks at me and he said, Do you want to know why I yelled at you? I said, Well, actually, yes. <laughs> why? He said, Are you ready for this? I don't think you are. Listen to this. He looked at me and he said, because we have to be better than them. Now, you may not get that, because you might be one of the them. What he was saying is, we're Jews. We're in a Gentile Christian atmosphere, and we need to be better than them. I went over this with his son, John, when he was teaching a course here once. And I said, I told him the story, and I said, what did, he, what did he really mean by Did he mean what I think he meant by that? And John said, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I said, did, he, did, you got, did you ever have any relationship with your family? He said, never, not one. This is the son, John, not, not Charles, the father. I said, wow. And I said, wow. And then he said something that just startled me. He said, and you know, he never felt at home in the church. I said, really? He was known as, you know, sort of, he's training pastors. You know, he said, he was always uncomfortable in the church. What I'm trying to tell you is that was Joseph's influence as well. Joseph was never comfortable in the church. Charles was never comfortable in the church. Leopold was never comfortable in the church. But they loved their fellow Christians. But they just couldn't embrace the culture. 
And they found as long as they can do their messianic meetings and do what they were doing, that they were fine. And they would go to the church, and they would get baptized, and, and everything else. But they never settled the issue in their own soul. Now, I know that Alan wants me to close. And so I am going to close. But not before. Yeah, I'm going to have questions. OK, next one, Juan. This is the Williamsburg building. That's an old picture. I just preached there two months ago to the Puerto Rican Hispanic Assembly of God Church that now owns the building and bought it from the Cohens in the, and bought it from the ABMJ in the 1960s. We actually had the, the building of Manhattan and the Williamsburg building, which was an outpost ministry to Hasidic Jews up until the 60s. And uh, sweetest, sweetest church and pastor and everything else. Next one. 15 years ago, I tried to buy this building back. ABMJ sold it to the Southern Baptists. I was even willing to condo the seven floors and sell the Baptists a floor. And I, ha I was this close. And then they changed leadership, and I lost it. So now I just look at it on my way to Zabar's. But Joseph was quite the, he was a builder, literally, literally. They owned apartment houses. They owned all sorts of things, including this farm. And here's my favorite picture. That's Leopold. So Leopold, the farmer. And they would go up to Eastern Connecticut every summer to summer in Connecticut. And he would work the land. And they would bring up Jewish kids from the Jewish ghettos in Brooklyn and the Bronx and other places. And they'd have summer camp going all year. And to this day, 125 years later, one of our, the most important ministries we have in Chosen People is our summer camps, but not in Connecticut. They're in Pennsylvania, usually. And, and so Sahab and I got very curious about this. And so we went to the Eastern Connecticut Record Hall, which is very small because it's a very small little place, and found all the deed transfers. And what happened was, and there's pages of this, because it was 90 acres. And it was before they inherited it, and they bought it in 1906 around, and therefore, there was no IRS. So they received it personally. And at the end of it all, they, it just became the family property. Because Mrs. Huntley was you know, financing the family, financing the mission. You know, it was hard to be. Hard to figure it all out. So there's a lot more to say about Joseph. Uh, I've just begun exploring his life. I've come to actually love the man, having spent the last 22 years fearing the man. <laughs> and But I still see him saying one thing to all of us. Get busy. Yeshua is coming. <laughs> <laughs> and, for, and quite honestly, it's 125 years later, and so this second-generation Jewish entrepreneur, like so many other Jewish men of his ilk, who took over for their visionary fathers and built organizations and businesses in the new world, this really was the family business. It was the fam family nonprofit business. Yes, I would have too, but I only ended up with one of his bookshelves in my office. But Joseph it was a very typical second-generation Jewish immigrant from Eastern Europe who was an entrepreneur, who was a businessman, but also uh, ideologically and faith-driven. But he built chosen people just like so many other businesses were built by these great Jewish leaders who were embattled, struggled, um, couldn't go home and go over the books in English with their parents, 
probably ended up doing the books when they were 11 years old because their parents didn't, couldn't do it. And so Joseph Hoffman Cohn left a great a legacy. He took the rabbi's vision and turned it into a century-plus-year-old reality. That's it for me. Easy questions first. Okay, we're gonna, we, well, you know, we're running a little late, but who cares? Uh, we will take a couple of questions for Mitch before we, uh, pre before we break for lunch, and... Um, doctrinal statement. Uh, on the ABMJ, we used to have a very uh, premillennial, dispensational, doc pardon the doctrinal statement. Was that also part of the doctrinal sta statement that uh, Leopold had, or was Hoffman the one instrumental in introducing that to our state? I once studied all of our early doctrinal statements, hmm. and... Uh, and the doctrinal statement definitely predated Joseph Hoffman Cohn becoming general secretary. It didn't, it was probably in, in almost at the turn of the century where they had beginning doctrinal statements and, and later on. However, um, I'm of the firm opinion that though Joseph didn't come become in charge until 1937, his father's death, that Joseph was probably running the mission probably from about World War I on through. And uh, we've been talking a lot about this between us, Menachem and, and, and I, and the question is, how, how did, it's not how, how did Joseph Hoffman Cohn learn English, it's how did Leopold Cohn write, learn English? How did, how did he write what he wrote? He, must, he had to have help, and probably a lot of his help was Joseph. So if anybody wrote the doctrinal statement, it was probably one of the board members or, or Joseph. Was there uh, section on premium language? Oh, yeah, always. Always, because uh, their doctrinal statement was a reflection, was for the church. So it was a reflection of the liberal fundamentalist controversy, and most of the fundamentalists actually were in one way or another premillennial. And a lot of them were sort of uh, dispensational, pre-tribulational pre regarding the rapture and things like that. So it was definitely a reflection of their constituency within the church. For some of you who know this stuff inside and out, remember, the father of, we're not going to talk about Schofield and other guys, but, but the, the, the person who founded Dallas Theological Seminary was a Presbyterian pastor. So, but Lewis Sperry Chafer was a sort of a product of the fundamentalist controversies. These guys were, I knew some of them, you knew some of them. Man, they were belligerent, crusty, leaders because they were always embattled. The Cones were embattled from within. They were embattled with, from, with the Jewish community. They were fighting the liberal fundamentalist controversy. And then there were a lot of problems with the fundamentalists because sometimes the most conservative among the fundamentalists were the ones who believed all the conspiracy theories about the Jews. And so there was a constant. Mitch, Mitch once told me one of the first things that he learned as the leader of a mission is to have a very firm grasp of what's coming out in publications. Remember you mentioned And graphic that? design. And graphic design, which is not my department. Okay, hang on. Uh, let's see. Um, Ben's raising his hand constantly. I know, I know. <laughs> Trying to get somebody in that hasn't had a chance to ask a question yet. So we have pride of place to one of our speakers. <laughs> so I have a little comment and a question. The comment is about the question, who is a Jew? Or better said, who is a better Jew? You know, you mentioned that both Leopold and Joseph they kept the laws of Kashrut. And that was actually in the same time where the reformed Jewish movement decided that laws of Kashrut were already absolute, obsolete. And then even in their own conferences, they, they used to serve uh, the shrimps and pork and took pride Yes, in the fact that they, they already became over this. Uh, they were real the, Americans. They were real Americans. They were real <laughs> Jews, modern Jews who, who could give up this, uh, this um, obsolete uh, tradition. So this is, this is my, my comment. And my, my question is, what happened when uh, the mission became from uh, 
family business in the transition to a gen more general uh, management. What was the the process there? How how did it work? Why no one from the family took the mission uh, to, to the third generation? Okay, it's it's a it's a great question with an unfortunate answer, um, because I've been I've been studying the continued line of the Cohens, and uh, the only one of of the, the the one who would have been the natural leader uh, after Joseph would have been his son Huntley Stone, who was a Princeton graduate and became a lawyer. Eventually moved to Connecticut, lived on the farm. They they grew up on the farm, worked in a law firm in Bridgeport, went out to Denver, and actually Huntley Stone's th three children all became lawyers, and one of them also went to Princeton. And so <clears throat> I would say that, uh, and we don't know whether or not, from our perspective, he was a believer in Jesus. He was on the board of, Cho of the ABMJ for a short period of time, maybe three or four years. And so we're not confident of two things, whether faith in Yeshua really bridged the generations and whether Jewishness bridged the, faith, uh, the, the generations. In meeting um, Joseph's great-granddaughter, uh, who may, I don't know, maybe it was the same woman who came to you, but in meeting Joseph's great-granddaughter, um, who lives in, in Arkansas, and then getting introduced, to, we had a phone call with other family members where we talked about this. And they are, they're, I would say the family is mixed, that a, a lot of them are believers in Jesus. Uh, this one woman goes to a big Baptist church in northern Arkansas. Um, when it comes to being Jewish, it's it's... As far as I'm concerned, it's it's pretty well gone. And so I, I don't, we have a saying among believers, God doesn't have grandchildren. Sometimes he has children, but he doesn't have grandchildren. <laughs> and great-grandchildren are tough. And so that's one of the major problems. What, what actually happened was this fellow, Harold Pretlove, was on the board. He was part of the Dugan Bakery family which was a huge bakery run by fundamentalists in New Jersey. And so he became, very quickly, he became Joseph's replacement. However, it wasn't going perfectly, so they added two other people, so it became a troika. And it was Emil Gruen, it was Harold Pretlove, and Daniel Fuchs. Eventually, when you have a three-headed monster, the strongest head wins. And so Daniel, Daniel Fuchs knocked off the rest of them, and Daniel became more of a long-term president, Stuart mentioned his desk, for about 25 years. And uh, that's how that happened, and that's the, that's the best I can tell you. So the rest of it, if I started theorizing more, my wife would yell at me and say my historiography is wrong. So. Any of them are in uh, yes, the great granddaughters are, and uh, there's one also. Great great granddaughters are, and one great granddaughter is. But I think I've just begun. You know, I've got. I'm I'm doing all the genealogical work. Of course, I should turn it over to you, Mr. Malcolm. All right. Well, we're going to cut it off here because it's time to have lunch. Well, what about Ben? Ben, you know, ben, 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 well. It's only Chinese food. Okay, he's. Uh, so we're having Jewish food. Okay, go, go, Ben, by popular acclaim, you get to ask a question. No pressure, Ben, better be good. <laughs> Joseph Hoffman Cohen, which he led the mission through one of the most virulent anti Semitic periods in American history. How did he do it? Right. I would have thought that the mission would have easily crumbled given those circumstances. How did he do it? Okay. Uh, the full papers for all of us will be published in the next Messianic Jewish Journal, which is the academic journal of the Feinberg uh, program, and we're going to toss in uh, Brian's as well, and you will read my full story. Uh, I chart that course uh, a little bit. Um, 
Joseph managed the anti-Semitism, but as someone who really, and, and Menachem made it clear, was, and so did Moti, I mean, he was just, they were just so concerned about the welfare of the Jewish people. And so he made a number of trips to Europe, 1934, 1937, and uh, into 1938. And he went there with a pile of cash to buy out missionaries to the Jews. And he tried, I tell the whole story of Isaac Feinstein in Romania here, where he, he tried to get Isaac to leave, who eventually was killed by the Iron Guard and was one of the first martyrs, and his whole congregation was, was destroyed in Bucharest, in Yasht. And uh, so Joseph was very aware of it. He was very engaged with Henri Vincent, who was a Baptist pastor who was running the work of chosen people in Paris. And in, almost in every issue of the newsletter, you know, we still haven't heard from Henri Vincent, who was a Gentile, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, now, one of the reasons I didn't get into that so much in my lecture, even though I wrote on it, is because Alan will be covering a lot of that, right. okay? But uh, all I can say is he was quite the leader, and instead of crumbling, instead of giving up, he went in there and at time risked his own life, and he really worked to try and, and help the situation. And so, in my opinion, uh, anti-Semitism was not simply a mission experience. These were European Jewish immigrants watching their relatives get killed. And so that was a different kettle of fish. And so, and then after the war, I don't know if Alan's going to get into a lot of this, but after the war, the ABMJ placed missionaries like uh, Otto Samuel in Belgium to work in partnership. You can do all that. To work in partnership. And so there was a tremendous amount of relief work done by the ABMJ uh, after the war as well. 